Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to start the next panel. And I think you're going to find this a, a panel of considerable interest. You know, we, we have this debate going on right now with sequestration looming. Uh, should deficit reduction be all spending cuts or should it be a mix of spending cuts and revenue increases? In an important article in the Wall Street Journal last week, Martin Feldstein wrote, and I'm quoting, Republicans want to reduce the deficit by cutting government spending while Democrats insist that raising revenue must be part of the solution. Yet, Feldstein continued, the distinction between spending cuts and revenue increases breaks down if one considers tax expenditures. Here are some examples. If I buy a solar panel, the government pays me, but instead of sending me a check, it gives me a tax credit or a tax deduction. Congress should review tax expenditures and eliminate those the country can't afford. CBO Director Douglas Elmendorf earlier this month in testimony on the House side noted that economists generally agree the tax expenditures are really best viewed as a form of government spending. And maybe it was most summed up some years ago by Alan Greenspan, who referred to tax expenditures as tax entitlements and urged policy makers to look at deficit reduction from entitlement reform on both the spending and tax side of the ledger. This panel consists of four really interesting papers looking at various aspects of tax expenditure reform. We're going to hear from Joe Aldi, who's an assistant professor of public policy at the JFK School of Government at Harvard and a former special assistant to the President for Energy and Environment, who has written a paper on reforms or elimination of fossil fuel subsidies in the tax code. We'll hear from Karen Dynan, Vice President and Co-Director of Economic Studies at Brookings, uh, about a proposal for reform of tax expenditures related to retirement saving. We'll hear from Alan Veard, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, with a very interesting paper on reforms related to the tax treatment of mortgage interest and the mortgage interest deduction. And from Diane Lim, recently joined Pew Charitable Trusts as their chief economist after a number of years as chief economist at the Concord Coalition, who has written a paper on various approaches to tax expenditure limitations that cover an array of tax expenditures. One of the things that's interesting about these papers is they don't just look at the revenue or deficit impacts of the proposals that each of the four authors advance, uh, but they really dig into the economics of the proposals as well. Uh, by and large, these papers are designed to produce reforms that not only yield deficit reduction, but would also increase economic efficiency, and in some cases yield other gains, like reduced fossil fuel emissions, improved progressivity in the tax code, or increases in retirement savings. At least one of the papers and we'll get into this, also raises another really interesting issue. In the debate we're in in Washington these days, the division seems to be when you hear talk about tax reform uh, as to whether all savings from broadening the tax base should go into rate reduction or some should go into rate reduction and some should go into deficit reduction. Um, in Karen Dynan's paper, she takes some of the savings that aren't used for deficit reduction and uses them not for rate cuts, but for other tax reforms designed to improve retirement savings, especially by lower and middle income people, which to me opens up the whole interesting question of uh, other than deficit reduction, are rate cuts always economically the first place to go with tax expenditure savings, or are there other proposals that also merit consideration? So with that, we're gonna go to the panel. I'm gonna take my seat. We're, we're going to uh, start uh, with a question to each of the authors, uh, and I'm really going to start with Joe Alden. Uh, Joe, as you know, during the presidential campaign and Senate and House campaigns, members of both parties talk about increasing domestic energy production and becoming energy self-sufficient. Uh, in your proposal, you call for eliminating a dozen tax expenditures focused on oil, gas, and coal production, and one can already hear the response. 
uh, you're going to reduce domestic energy production in the United States and make us more dependent on foreign sources of energy. Uh, how would you respond to that? And relatedly, uh, how would you think about overcoming those objections in terms of the political debate and building support for the kinds of proposals you make? Thank you, Bob. I, I think it's important uh, first to, to understand exactly what are the kinds of subsidies uh, that I'm addressing in my proposal. Then I'll discuss a little bit about what we're really getting out of, uh, uh, out of these uh, tax expenditures and then close with this question about how one thinks about political strategy. Uh, so the vast majority of the provisions in the tax code that I call uh, for elimination uh, effectively lower the cost of investing in a new oil field, gas field, or a coal mine. Uh, basically by modifying different kinds of, of effectively depreciation rules. And in this way, it actually really distorts how one might make investment decisions in the economy because it really creates a, a, a more favorable uh, place for investment in fossil fuel uh, development than, say, investing in a new factory or any other kind of big capital uh, project. Now, the question is, if we're actually putting out something on the order of $4 billion a year uh, through these uh, subsidies in the tax code, what are we getting for it? And, uh, and uh, when you look at the analysis, we're actually getting very little. Uh, there's uh, some work that uh, my former colleague at Resources for the Future, Steve Brown, who also used to run the oil and gas shop at the Dallas Fed, said, well, you know, if we, in his analysis, if we got rid of the oil and gas subsidies, we'd be looking at something like uh, reduction in oil uh, production in the U.S. on the order of 25,000 barrels per day. Now, 25,000 barrels may sound big. When you look at, A, uh, how much we produce in the U.S. now, which has been growing quite rapidly, you look at the growth each month over the last four years, each month we're growing more than that amount. So it's a really, it's a really small amount that when you actually look at the impact on prices, probably means the typical American will be paying something on the order of about a dollar or more each year. So you start to ask yourself, if the production impact is less than what we'd actually see in a, a month in the kind of ramping up we're seeing now, if we think about the prices, you know, on a per capita basis, we're putting out more than $10 a person in subsidies, and we might see the total expenditures we face increase by about a dollar a year, that doesn't sound like a really good deal for the typical American. Uh, and so what we really see is when you assess these subsidies, the vast majority of them are actually just going to the owners of capital in oil and gas and coal, and not really subs substantively changing their production decisions. So we've seen a dramatic increase in production in oil and gas, especially in the United States over the last five years. That's not because of these subsidies. Some of these subsidies have been on the books dating back to 1970, when we started a period of about four decades where oil consumption, or excuse me, oil production fell in half. Instead, it's $100 oil, and it's dramatic improvements in technology that have lowered the cost of extracting oil and gas that have led to the significant ramping up of production in the United States. If we got rid of these subsidies, we would still see significant growth in both oil and gas uh, in the years to come. The question is sort of the politics on this, of, of how does one actually craft a strategy to go forward. I think there's one of two ways you could approach this. One is to think about this in the context of overall corporate tax reform. In the past, when people try to push fossil fuel subsidy elimination, it's been sort of a standalone policy debate. If you actually were to pair it with, say, a reform of the overall uh, corporate tax, in which you might, say, be lowering the marginal tax rates on companies, all of a sudden, some of these companies that benefit from these subsidies may say that, I'm better off with a lower marginal rate if I have to give up some of these uh, investment benefits through the tax code. The other approach one might take, which I would sort of describe as sort of a, a, a fiscal hawk or a deficit hawk approach, is to say, let's get rid of subsidies for all energy, whether it's fossil fuels, energy efficiency, renewables, nuclear. Now, if you're to do that, you could say, hey, we're going to be able to save even more money in the tax code. If you're to do that, I think it's really important, though, to recognize that the um, tax provisions that support nuclear and renewables and efficiency are also delivering very important social benefits in terms of reduced air pollution and reduced carbon pollution. So if you're going to do something like that, I think it's important to actually pair a, uh, uh, a reform of all energy subsidies with policies such as a carbon tax that we'll hear about later on this afternoon or a clean energy standard or other policies that create in the private sector demand for these lower emitting socially beneficial technologies to offset the loss of the support they would get uh, through this reform of the tax code. We're going to go now to Karen Dynan. Um, 
Karen, you know, some years ago I was fascinated by a paper Brookings put out, co-authored by Lily Batchelder, Fred Goldberg, Peter Rorzag. It referred to certain parts of the tax code as having upside down subsidies and it included retirement savings as one. It didn't have a specific proposal as to exactly what, where to go on that. You have a particular proposal and you propose to limit savings for retirement subsidies for higher income households and to take some of the savings and devoting them to changes in other aspects of the tax code designed to promote more savings by retirement saving by lower and moderate income households. Now, following a similar pattern is my question to Joe, here too you can already hear the, what the pushback would be. People would say uh, national saving is important, retirement saving is part of national saving, uh, the bulk of saving comes from people at higher income level. You're limiting the uh, tax subsidy for retirement savings at higher income levels. Uh, are you going to end up reducing total retirement saving and total national saving? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, first of all, let me um, talk about uh, what you shouldn't take away from my paper. So you shouldn't take away that um, national saving isn't important. It's very, very important. Um, you, you know, national countries that have higher rates of saving tend to have higher rates of business investment. And what that means is that businesses have more equipment and software and structures to go about producing goods and services, uh, which means that they produce more and it means that growth will be higher. So, uh, you know, in fact, you know, the whole point of the exercise today is to, uh, you know, find ways to trim the budget deficit and, you know, part of what that's going to do is it's going to increase public saving, which will foster higher national savings. So national saving is very important. Um, you know, it's also true, as you said, that higher income households account for much of aggregate personal saving. Um, so any kind of reform that uh, caused higher income household, households to uh, reduce their savings significantly could be harmful to the economy. So we wouldn't want that. But research shows that, in fact, um, changes like capping the deductibility uh, of, of contributions to retirement plans at 28% shouldn't have a big effect on the saving of higher, individual, higher income individuals. So um, there have been some, some, some very good, very comprehensive studies that show that most people actually don't respond much in terms of their saving when you make changes like that. And the people that do respond, they respond by kind of shuffling their, their portfolios. They, they take stuff out of retirement accounts, they put it in other sorts of accounts, but there's not you know, a big impact on their overall saving. So one wouldn't expect from my proposal to uh, see lower saving amongst the higher income uh, people. And in fact, you could see an increase in aggregate saving because I've cobbled it with proposals that should encourage um, lower income households to save. Alan Veard has written a paper calling for converting the mortgage interest deduction into a refundable credit at a 15% rate with a cap, I think, on $300,000 uh, of, of mortgage. Uh, needless to say, uh, here one could hear people say, you're attacking the American dream of home ownership, plus uh, housing is an important part of the economy. Weakness in housing has hurt the economy right now. Uh, even if your proposal made sense down the road, aren't you worried about the immediate effect on the economy? Again, I'm trying to ask each of you the challenges that would be made to your papers. Uh, Alan? Yes, well, home ownership uh, obviously does have a special political status in the United States, and I think it would be a, a futile endeavor to really try to undermine the tax breaks for home ownership. But what my proposal does is it tries to target the preferences for housing in a way that maintains an incentive for home ownership while curtailing what I think is a very misdirected, very pernicious incentive for investment in large, expensive owner-occupied homes. It comes back to the upside-down uh, subsidy point that we've uh, already heard about, that the current tax system uh, gives the biggest tax breaks 
to people in the highest brackets and for the most expensive homes. And we can certainly make a case, I think, that there are social benefits uh, from having people own homes, and obviously homes of adequate uh, quality, uh, but it's really hard to see how directing resources away from business investment into the construction of mansions and very large homes uh, is really uh, beneficial. The social objectives that we're trying to achieve you know, really occur, I think, uh, lower down the scale. And the current tax preferences really fall short in that regard. Uh, people who don't itemize deductions, people who are in very low tax brackets, get little or no assistance in uh, moving into home ownership. And in fact, if you think about the fact that the tax breaks are driving up demand for owner-occupied homes by people higher up in the scale, increasing the overall level of housing prices, then the people who are not in a position to take advantage of those tax breaks actually may find it more difficult to, uh, to buy a home than they would if uh, the government was just uh, pursuing a more neutral policy. So what I propose actually is not moving towards a completely neutral policy, but keeping, I think, what is a very robust incentive for home ownership, but just targeting it better, saying that on the first $300,000 of mortgage, you can claim a credit equal to 15% of your mortgage interest. The credit is refundable. Even if you don't owe income tax, you can receive the credit in cash. And so you're really giving a much more generous tax break to people at the bottom, people who maybe wouldn't itemize and today can't claim the mortgage interest deduction, or people who are in the 10% bracket. We're saying you'll actually get this 15% tax savings regardless whether you itemize your deductions or not, but we are going to cap this at the 300000 uh, level. Now, obviously, there's always a question of transition here. There's the macroeconomic weakness that you asked about. There's also just the reliance interest people have purchased homes based on the availability of today's tax breaks, and we can't pull the rug out from under people. That wouldn't be right. It also wouldn't be politically feasible. And so I propose you know, a 10-year transition period, first of all, waiting a couple years to start the proposal at all, then a t transition period of 10 years. I think that the details of how you handle the transition can be worked out. I think it would be a mistake to let the concern about the transition cause us to either not pursue this reform or even to scale back the substance of it. Uh, it's important that we do move uh, eventually to a policy regime where our housing subsidies are much more rational, where they do continue to support the dream of home ownership, but not the uh, objective of uh, having ever more, ever larger, ever more expensive homes. You know, if I, if I remember correctly, and maybe I don't, in the 1986 Tax Reform Act in the Senate Finance Committee, I think they first worked out the broad set of reforms they wanted to do, and then went back and said, okay, what are the transition rules we need to support those reforms? Now, Diane, your paper takes a different approach. Rather than looking specifically at one deduction or one set of tax preferences, you look at, and we've heard a lot about this over the past year and in some of the campaigns, uh, you look at these sort of more global proposals to put a broader limitation on a whole array of tax expenditures. Uh, could you both describe those proposals a little bit, but also describe a little, what's the attraction? Why are people interested in these sort of more global limitations? Okay, well first, um, I don't want to overpromise my proposal or have Bob overpromise my proposal. Mine's not quite as sweeping as I might like to have done in theory, um, and it's probably the least innovative proposal of this panel because it's been proposed by President Obama essentially in every one of his budgets thus far. It's just that my version is a slightly more ambitious, tighter, tighter one that raises more revenue. So. My proposal is to, and, and I should stress it's my proposal and not the Pew Charitable Trust proposal, is to limit itemized deductions to the 15% bracket. President Obama has repeatedly proposed limiting it to the 28% bracket. Um, and that was done largely to preserve the promise to not raise taxes on households under 250,000. Um, I happen to think that we need to start looking at reducing tax expenditures more broadly across the taxpayer uh, spectrum. Um, otherwise, Republicans are never going to come along to raising revenue, even if it's base broadening. It has to be more of um, a shared sacrifice kind of uh, change, and it also has to be very obviously 
broadening the tax base and reducing tax expenditures in the scope of government. Um, so I propose to limit the, the rate at which you can take item as deductions to 15%. What that does is it gets rid of a lot of the upside down subsidies we've been talking about. So it's a progressive revenue increase. It's a revenue increase that broadens the base, however, and therefore can keep marginal rates low. It's a tax increase that doesn't target particular industries, and I did that because I didn't want anyone to feel like I was picking on them, but a lot of my reviewers in the paper said, oh, you're just going to get everyone to hate you instead of just the <laughs> Home Builders Association. Um, so then I said, well, okay, maybe charitable contributions, there's an argument to keeping that deduction or the incentive for making that deduction at the high end, and that had nothing to do with me going to Pew Charitable Trust, by the way, and because um, I wrote it before I went to Pew. But, um, uh, and so I said, well, if you're going to let some of those current itemized deductions be exempt uh, from this limit, then we should at least try to save in the cost of those preferences somehow. So I suggested putting a floor on charitable contributions deduction, which of course complicates the system and this is full of trade-offs. But I think one key to keep in mind is that this is a progressive way of raising revenue. It doesn't raise marginal tax rates. And the alternative is not not raising revenue. The alternative is that we'd have to cut spending. And it's much harder on the direct spending side. And it is really impossible to cut spending on the direct spending side in a progressive way. And so I think if people start to view these cuts in tax expenditures as being a different way of cutting spending rather than a different way of raising revenue, one of which might be don't raise revenue, I think that that would be um, I think it would increase the chances of these proposals having appeal not just to Democrats who want to raise taxes on the rich, not just to Republicans who want to cut spending, but for um, bipartisan efforts that look at efficient ways of raising revenue in progressive ways. So I want to turn now to our discussant, Adam Looney. Adam is the policy director of the Hamilton Project, and he's also a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution. Uh, thank you very much, Bob, and thank you for four very great papers. Uh, I very much enjoyed reading them. Uh, so I wanted to start off today talking a bit about tax reform. So obviously the last time we had a real tax reform was more than 25 years ago with the Tax Reform Act of 86. And I think everybody looks back fondly on that experience as a time when we cut loopholes, broadened the base, uh, and used the revenues to lower tax rates. And what we sometimes forget is that was also a reform that included raising corporate taxes to help finance those lower rates on individuals, uh, that it was a reform that didn't touch any of the largest tax breaks or deductions, including that for mortgage interest, uh, that it occurred in an era before we had really discovered uh, the phenomenon of rising income inequality, and before uh, places like the Joint Committee on Taxation uh, had developed the tools they have today to accurately model uh, how tax changes affect different groups. And so if you, just for example, if you go back and you look at the documentation from that era, uh, the distributional tables, uh, the combination of corporate tax increases, uh, elimination of shelters, and the, and the lower rates on individuals achieves what must be the holy grail of tax reform in the sense that it's a tax reform that was revenue neutral in the aggregate, but that within each income group, everybody got a tax cut. Uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, I'm sure that wasn't the only reason why policymakers were so much more agreeable back then, uh, but it couldn't, it couldn't have hurt. And so I, I think uh, when you go back and uh, when, when you look at the prospects for tax reform today, I think the job is just much harder. Uh, we can't cut the same loopholes twice. Uh, the, the, the deductions and the uh, tax breaks that have been left on the table time and again, year after year, have been left there for good reason. Uh, uh, we're probably not going to get any revenues from the corporate side. If we're really serious about deficit reduction, if we do manage to find loopholes and if we do broaden the tax base, it's likely that those revenues will need to go to deficit reduction rather than to lower tax rates. Uh, and because of heightened concerns about income inequality and the effects of taxes on different groups, uh, any of the choices that we do make are just going to be scrutinized in the political process. Uh, and that just makes it even more difficult to achieve consensus. Uh, and so the, the challenge facing these authors 
uh, when, to ask, when asked to find revenues within the current system, it's just that, that much harder than it has been in the past. And, and as a result, I think that they take a, a different approach than we've used in the past. They go after uh, what Bob called tax expenditures, those provis provisions in the tax system that could just as readily be achieved in their budgetary and economic effects through direct spending programs. Uh, and so what the authors do is they go through the tax code and they say, uh, with the same scrutiny that, that, that might be applied to spending programs, and they say, wh which of the areas of, uh, that are wasteful or, or inefficient, uh, and which ones can we improve, both to raise revenue and to improve their functioning. Three of the papers, obviously, uh, take on specific areas of spending through the tax code, uh, mortgage interest, subsidies for fossil fuel extraction, um, uh, retirement savings, uh, things that, that would just have a hard time as standalone categories had they been classified under domestic discretionary spending rather than under the, under the, uh, the title of revenues. Uh, they're expensive, uh, they're often regressive, uh, and they often fail to, to achieve their, their basic goals. Uh, uh, just to give one example, it would feel preposterous today to propose a new entitlement uh, for home ownership that cost $100 billion a year that was targeted primarily to people who already own homes, uh, whose benefits mostly accrued to people in the, uh, in the upper, uh, the top half of the income distribution, and whose maximum benefit was reserved for people in the highest income bracket who had agreed to buy million dollar homes. Uh, and, and yet that's, that's what we do. Uh, and, and we've done, been doing it for a long time. You know, wh one reason is obviously that such breaks are very popular. Uh, another, mm -hmm. another theory is that we've, we, do, we tend to do a, a weaker job in picking and choosing among constituencies or picking and choosing among uh, specific programs because of political difficulties. Uh, the approach that Diane Lim takes is, of course, not to target any particular group, but to apply a haircut across the board uh, th that raises uh, even more revenues in, in her proposal. Uh, it ameliorates some of the distortions in the current system, uh, and it has that political benefit of, of not targeting any, any particular uh, constituency. Uh, so I, I was going to also mention Martin Feldstein and paraphrase his, his political analysis. Uh, you know, the, the Republicans want to address the deficit by, by cutting spending. Democrats want to include revenues in their deficit plans, uh, shouldn't there be a middle ground? And so uh, I think, first of all, it's obviously not that simple, uh, but I have to say that I find that argument compelling, and, and so I hope uh, in that spirit that, that people uh, are interested in these proposals. Great, so I'd, I'd like to ask a couple of questions to the panel as a group. So the first one relates to a bit of a tension between Diane's paper and the other papers. So as we've discussed, one of the political advantages of Diane's paper is the policymakers don't have to single out the mortgage interest or other popular uh, tax expenditures in the code, and you just do it generally, and there are political observers around town and people on the Hill you can talk to who say, well, if we do anything at all, it'll, it'll be a tax expenditure limitation. Having said that, if you look not so much at Diane's proposal, but as she mentioned, the leading proposals till now on tax expenditure limitations, the Obama proposal, mm -hmm. uh, the Feldstein proposal to limit certain tax expenditures to 2% of adjusted gross income, the idea Governor Romney proposed during the campaign of a dollar cap on itemized deductions. Those proposals would not affect the fossil fuel tax expenditures Joe writes about. Uh, what I was a little struck by when I looked, I hadn't realized until we looked, is none of those three proposals put tax expenditures for retirement savings under their limitations. It remains untouched outside the limitation in all of those proposals. And while those limitations do cover the mortgage interest deduction, uh, they don't get you, because they're just a limitation, to some of the restructuring Allen proposes, like converting the deduction into a refundable credit. Mm -hmm. So there's a tension uh, here. Um, I would argue that from a policy standpoint, 
uh, the best might be a blend of the two, where you have a limitation on some things and policy changes in the fossil fuels, retirement savings, and the like. And the counter could be, Bob, you're just doubling the political difficulty by trying to do both. So I just wanted to ask the panel to comment on the tension between an across the board, not, not across the board, a limitation on certain tax expenditures that has the obvious political advantage and the policy advantages of being able to go into individual areas and make certain redesigns and to touch things like Joe, what you talk about, that wouldn't be, or, or what Karen talks about, that probably won't be touched under a limitation. Wh whoever wants to go first. So I actually would characterize my sort, type of approach as almost an across the board tax expenditure cut. And um, I think of it as, um, you know, my pro this proposal is not innovative or particularly elegant, but it's easy. It's an easy proposal and it raises a lot of revenue. Do I like all three of the other proposals? Yes, very much. And I think that if we're engaging in tax reform, we should be looking at how the tax system treats uh, energy markets and retirement savings and mortgage interest more closely because maybe there are arguments there to pare back those tax expenditures uh, more significantly than these across the board measures would allow. Honestly, I'm, I think that the across the board approach has the appeal of being more likely to be thought of as a budget proposal rather than a tax reform proposal because I don't think there's any, um, there's not much force right now, there's not much pressure to engage in fundamental tax reform whereas we do have this thing called the sequester coming up and um, I would point out that limiting itemized deductions to 15% would raise about a trillion dollars over 10 years which coincidentally is about the value of the sequester. I would have preferred, I've always pushed for this sort of limitation on itemized deduction as a good way to pay for extension of any of the Bush tax rate cuts. Now that's gone of course, um, which by the way makes the revenue estimate an overstatement now because that was based on the old current law baseline. But um, I believe that since we can't use it to pay for tax rate cut extensions, we could at least use it now to pay to avoid spending cuts that are much more regressive in incidence. Yeah, I think this is an excellent question and really gets to you know, the issue of how, what's the most politically effective way uh, and the most economically beneficial way to try to tackle something as broad as the tax system. I, I think it will be somewhere between the two extremes. I mean, on the one hand, you know, we can talk about an across the board provision but nobody is really talking about across the board because, as Diane said, I mean, charity would probably get a uh, you know, special treatment and, and probably should and so forth. So the, the issue is not so much being literally across the board doing the same thing to all of the tax expenditures out there, but simply starting from a broad perspective and saying now from that starting point, let's see which ones maybe should be taken out of this, which ones maybe get uh, somewhat uh, different treatment. At the other extreme, I don't think it's realistic to believe that like a single major provision could be reformed on its own. I mean, economically, I believe it'd be beneficial for something like my mortgage proposal to be adopted regardless of what was being done with anything else. But politically, you wouldn't expect to see the mortgage deduction restructured in a major way while everything else is being left untouched. So I think it'll end up being some middle ground, just like the 86 Act was, where a whole range of provisions are being uh, modified where there's probably some similarity in how different provisions are being treated, but not a uh, exactly identical treatment across them. So I think you could almost start from either vantage point. Start with something that you might call across the board or start with a collection of specific proposals and, and you'll end up converging to that, to that type of middle ground. I would just say that you know, Adam made the right point, which is uh, some of these provisions have lasted a long time in the tax code. So the two most prominent provisions that are in my proposal have been on the book since 1913 wow. and the 1920s. Now, the world of oil and gas drilling is a lot different now than it was then. Uh, but it says something about how uh, once we actually get certain provisions in the tax code, and if they're written back in a time when we didn't put sunset provisions on everything that passed in uh, a tax extenders bill, uh, 
uh, you uh, create the interest and sort of maintain that kind of, of subsidy through the tax code. And I think part of it is trying to think through politically. And I, and I think the way you were framing the opening questions, Bob, is exactly the right way to do this, which is, okay, this makes economic sense. We have a bunch of economists up here that says this makes economic sense. How do we make this into political sense? How do we actually frame this as, as a way where there's some kind of package? And I think that's the way, uh, whether it's a package on, on um, the personal income side, they get to some of these, and then think about something on the corporate income side. It obviously has to be more than just Let's get a bill, thumbs up or thumbs down on fossil fuel subsidies. So I think that the magic has to be in how one crafts a combination of these elements uh, that actually gets broad interest in uh, that kind of reform. I, I just sort of add a point here too, um, is there are certain kinds of tax breaks that as best I know, and maybe I'm missing something, I can't see how you could design a limitation to touch them. So the most obvious example would be something like carried interest. But there's a bunch of others. There's like-kind exchanges, uh, which is a pretty egregious way of avoiding tax on certain kinds of real property transactions. There's valuation discounts with related to the estate tax. There's things that, from on a policy, not a political, a policy basis, are low-hanging fruit and that they're hard to justify the current treatment. But you would have to be able to win them individually. You couldn't design, as best I could see, limitations of deal with those. Let me turn to a different question and particularly ask Karen. And I alluded to this at the end of my opening remarks, that we kind of have this conversation where there are two candidates on the table for revenue you could raise from tax expenditure reform. And there are deficit reduction and rate cuts. And you choose to take a portion of your savings and you put them back into the tax code, but not as rate cuts, but as a change in a small business credit related to running retirement plans for your employees and changes in the savers credit. And I'm, I'm wondering, could you briefly describe the proposal, but more broadly talk about uh, the economics here? Uh, if you got a challenge and said, well, anything that goes back into the tax code, the first claim on it should be rate cuts. Uh, rather than what you've proposed. Could, could you kind of talk about that and how you see the economics of this issue? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's like any time you save some money, there are choices as to what you're going to do with it. So you can bank it or you can spend it in different ways. Uh, in this context, you know, you've talked about the possibility of you know, cutting rates, which would be one way of spending the money that's conserved by broadening the base. Um, and that would have economic benefits. But it's, but it's a question of priorities, uh, you know, as it always is with these choices. So the fact is that many American families have um, very little financial assets. So, uh, in my paper, I look at families who are in their peak saving years, and I find that if you look at the bottom 20%, those folks have financial assets that amount to about a week's worth of their income. And even going up to the next 20%, you're finding these families in their peak saving years, again, have financial assets that amount to less than two months worth of, uh, worth of their income. So, so these families don't have much in savings, and they need savings. So they need savings in part to secure um, you know, a comfortable retirement, uh, but also because savings allows them to pursue opportunities. It allows them to um, pursue higher education. It allows them to pursue home ownership. And um, you know, also, families need saving just to be able to, to weather unexpected disruptions to income or spending needs. Um, you know, and these, these, you know, addressing these needs is not just about the well-being of these families, it's about the economy as a whole. Um, for example, you know, if people have more access to education, that's going to make for a stronger labor force. If people don't find that their spending has to be lurched around by shocks to their income because they have some sort of buffer they can spend out of, well, that's going to make for more resilient consumer demand. So, so, you know, there are good reasons to uh, make uh, promoting saving amongst low and moderate income households a high priority. What I suggest in my proposal is um, a few different things. I mean, what we know kind of works for these families are, uh, you know, simple, easy to use, 
vehicles for saving. So um, one of the most effective things has been found to be um, employer-sponsored retirement plans with contributions that are automatically deducted from payrolls and automatic enrollment at a default rate. Um, so those plans are great. They do seem to encourage new savings. The problem is that only 55% of private sector workers are, um, are covered. So that's why in my proposal I propose uh, increasing the tax credit for firms that establish and administer these plans uh, to encourage more of these plans to be formed. And also for firms for whom that doesn't make sense. You know, it's going to be small firms, you know, that, that you know, don't find uh, it's worth the money or the energy to establish one of these plans to require those firms to um, uh, open uh, uh, IRA accounts for their employees uh, and have, um, again, contributions automatically deducted from earnings. Um, you know, you can mitigate the burden on these firms by uh, providing tax breaks for them doing so. And, you know, this would be a, a you know, a plan where people could, could opt out if they, if they wanted to. You're not forcing them to participate, but research shows that it does uh, raise the saving of these people. Uh, others want to jump in on this question, anybody, about rate cuts or Alan? Yeah, I mean, I think, let me uh, say that my proposal I think adopts the same general philosophy that Karen's does. It's not uh, two separate components in the case of my proposal, it's bundled into one, but when I replace the existing mortgage interest deduction with this refundable credit, obviously part of the revenue you know, that could otherwise have been uh, devoted to deficit reduction or to rate reduction ends up being used instead to provide more generous tax breaks at the bottom. Anyone who's not who doesn't owe income tax today, anyone who doesn't itemize deductions today, anybody in the 10% bracket today you know, would be getting a bigger uh, subsidy uh, for home ownership under my proposal than they would under current laws. So that's where I use part of the uh, revenue uh, uh, to, to serve those goals. I think that's, a, in general, an approach that should always be considered. These tax preferences are durable. They're politically popular. And we have to recognize that that's because they do attempt to serve or are marketed as serving you know, some type of widely held social objective. And so a very promising strategy, I think, both politically and economically, is to say, you know, let's curb the uh, excesses or the misdirected aspects of these provisions in ways that will raise some revenue, but at the same time, let's actually put something in there that will more directly and more effectively serve the objectives that have always been associated with these things. So I think that's an approach that should always be considered in uh, the tax reform debate. Obviously, the way it plays out depends on the exact provision involved. Uh, but I think it's a sound general approach. Come back, Joe, to your paper for a minute. Uh, there are a lot of issues involving trade negotiations with our trading partners that involve energy. How would your proposal to eliminate a dozen tax expenditures, a dozen mm -hmm. tax expenditures relating to oil, gas, and coal interact with our trade negotiations with other countries? Well, if you go back four years ago at the uh, Pittsburgh G20 summit, there was actually an agreement among all the major developed and developing countries to eliminate their fossil fuel subsidies. And just a month after that, at the APEC summit, uh, the leaders of the APEC nations also agreed to eliminate their fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, this effort was spearheaded by the United States by President Obama, and it's tough to go back to these countries and say, no, you really need to do more on this front when he hasn't been able to deliver that here at home. And I think it's important to recognize what the potential economic implications are in the United States if you could achieve this kind of subsidy reform globally. So while the subsidies in the United States focus on production, in most of the developing world and among major energy exporters, their subsidies are almost exclusively on the consumer side. And it's actually an ex excess of a half a trillion dollars a year globally. So we're talking about a lot of money going to subsidize consumption. If these countries were to eliminate their subsidies, you would actually see efficiency and conservation measures in these countries that actually means globally we'll be consuming less oil. Uh, the International Energy Agency estimates on the order of about four million barrels a day. What that means to US consumers, we actually pay less for gasoline and diesel and heating oil as the world price falls with this lower demand and lower consumption. Uh, that also means we'll have lower greenhouse gas emissions. So the environmental benefit is really leveraged, and, and the economic and energy benefit to the United States is really leveraged by not just undertaking this effort, but by the enabling uh, US negotiators to go to these major trade partners, 
major economic players and say, we've now delivered on this agreement and we want to see you step forward and deliver on the agreement that your head of state made in 2009 as well. So I think there's a lot of potential there to really um, multiply the energy, economic, environmental benefits of fossil fuel subsidy reform when one looks at what the U.S. government could do engaging these other countries after the elimination of subsidies in our tax code. Let me ask uh, one more question to the panel uh, broadly, very much including Adam. Uh, and then I think we're going to go to the audience for uh, Q&A. So in Alan's paper, he has a specific proposal for a transition rule over 10 years. My question kind of to the rest of you in particular, whether substantively or politically, with the fossil fuel subsidies, the retirement saving changes, a global limitation, would one need to work out transition rules there as well? Well, I think mine's pretty easy. I don't think you need transition rules um, for a limit to 15%. If, if politically people don't want to go there right away, you can always ratchet down. You can start at a higher rate and move it down. Lower the percentage. Right, right. lower the percentage limit over time. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, and, and there is an argument to say that if people know that their itemized deductions are going to be limited next tax year, they might have an incentive to do more spending in the tax preferred areas this year. So maybe there would be a little, a little stimulus kind of boost from that. I, well, so yeah. I would say uh, not in a um, uh, major way, although I think Diane's last point was an interesting one. I mean, I think the, the element in my plan that probably um, requires uh, you know, the most uh, transition is uh, this, uh, the, the automatic IRA element of the proposal where you're actually going to be asking um, firms, and in particular it would be small firms because small firms are the one, ones that are least likely to already be offering retirement savings plans to, to, to do something new, offer something new. So to, to, to mitigate the burden, you'd want to spread it out over time. Joe, I don't know this area, so this may be way off. Um, there's kind of a boom in certain areas of fossil fuel production going on now. You, couldn't you argue that actually this is a good time to make the change you're proposing as distinguished from a period when fossil fuel production is hurting and is down? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we've been in an, an, a period of time in which the price of oil has been between 80 and $100 a barrel since really the middle of 2009. Uh, when you look at the kind of forecasts that are out there, you look at the futures market, no one is expecting us to return to an era of really cheap oil. Um, so uh, when you look at that, there are really big returns to be made, and that's in part why we've seen a lot of, of, of increase in production uh, uh, of oil, especially here in the United States. And we've seen that kind of penetration of the new technologies that bring new resources into play that help lower the cost of, of production. Uh, so I think you're right. When one looks at it, there's a lot of activity that will continue because there's a lot of profits to, to be made even in the absence of these tax provisions. So this could be sort of a, you know, a better time to do this than say if you were to go back 15 years when oil was trading at $11, $12 a barrel. Then of course there would be a lot of opposition to anything that would actually affect uh, whether or not it makes sense to go forward. But uh, you look at the activity here in the US now, we have four times as many rigs operating uh, producing oil now than we did in 2008. It's, it's a dramatic increase in the activity. Um, and so uh, if we don't take advantage of this, the concern is actually not that uh, my proposal would save $40 billion over 10 years, but potentially a lot more if you think production is going to really ramp up with the uh, increase in, uh, in what seems to be commercially viable U.S. resource. Okay, I think we would... Oh, Alan, you know, just ahead. a brief comment. I think it is interesting how the politics of transition do seem to vary depending upon how proposals are framed. Uh, the president, for example, has not proposed any transition relief for his 28% uh, proposal. Um, I, I think that from an economic perspective, of course, the case for transition relief or the case against it it shouldn't be sensitive to whether proposals are being combined with others in an across-the-board approach or to whether they, they stand alone. If you think that there should be transition relief for existing homeowners uh, from a change to the mortgage deduction, uh, and I do think there should be, then I believe that that also still remains valid, uh, even if that's part of an overall 28% or overall 15% uh, 
proposal. And I wonder in the end if the politics really are much, uh, much different. Um, obviously the president did not feel impelled to provide, to propose transition relief up front, but if that proposal or Diane's modification of it was to receive more serious consideration, if it was to start moving closer to enactment, I think people would ask whether there should be transition relief for existing homeowners on the mortgage side, um, for municipal bond holders, uh, since the president's proposal at least would apply uh, to that as well. So I think the transition issues you know, always need to be confronted. And uh, it's also true that sometimes transition relief is implicit instead of explicit. I mean, Karen, your proposal I think would apply your limit to new contributions, right? Mm -hmm. And so therefore you automatically, you provided That's transition right. relief for contributions that have been, uh, been made in the past. But um, yeah, I don't think it's possible to sweep transition concerns under the rug, um, you know, just based on uh, whether you're doing an across the board approach or something more selective. You always have to think about that. Great, okay, we're going to go to the audience now, I, is, are there mics that are coming around? Yes, there are. Uh, the gentleman with a blue shirt and the vest? Yes, you. Maybe it's not blue, it looks blue to me from here. Assume, <laughs> assuming that I'm a congressman faced with two bills, the Lim bill and the Feldstein bill, assuming the CBO costs them, estimates they raise the same revenue, which bill should I vote for, both in terms of the economic merits of the bills and my electability? I'm sorry, did you? I'm sorry, I didn't you catch I'm sorry, we didn't, we couldn't quite yeah. catch. Which are the two bills you're referring to? My the Lim bill and the Marty Feldstein, Feldstein bill. Oh, oh, your proposal versus <laughs> what? <laughs> Diane? I feel like this is unfair because Marty's not here, but <laughs> yeah. um, of course you should vote for my bill. <laughs> But um, it's because uh, my approach, instead of capping the total amount, is sort of limiting the rate of the subsidy. So it's trying to preserve um, the same kind of marginal incentive uh, to give to charity or to take out a mortgage, um, that uh, the same subsidy rate across the full income spectrum. But it is not sort of arbitrarily putting a cap on whether that, that subsidy would continue above a certain level. So it doesn't cap it as much as limits the subsidy. Um, and so I feel like if there are reasons why we have these itemized deductions in the first place, presumably once upon a time we decided that these activities were worth subsidizing through the tax code. So instead of questioning that, and instead of picking on any particular subsidy, I'm saying, okay, there's an argument to subsidize these activities through the tax code, but let's just limit the cost of these subsidies by treating all taxpayers more, more uniformly. I would just add, I, I too would vote for Diane's over Marty's. Um, you just take charitable contributions as an example. Under the Feldstein, once you hit the cap, there is zero incentive, incentive for right. additional charitable contributions. Um, the second issue is Diane's proposal is progressive, and I think as Marty has acknowledged, given what is and isn't under his limitation, yeah. the net effect of his proposal is actually somewhat regressive. Uh, question right in front of the gentleman who asked before. <coughs> Oh, the mic's not on. What we're yeah, now it's on. What we're finding is that there's no good model for evaluating uh, the differences between tax expenditures, which have broad social, strategic, environmental, or economic value, and those which are pretty much poor pork and were put into the bill because they assisted a congressman in getting reelected. And uh, have any of you in your research run across any kind of a model that you would suggest, that we might suggest to the Congress for trying to differentiate between the effectiveness and the real value of different tax expenditures? Or if not, what would you suggest as some of the criteria that we might be suggesting to the Congress? Uh, well, the Government Accountability Office has been working on this issue for a long, long time, per, per, you know, pushing for performance-based budgeting. Uh, 
um, you know, applied to spending that's done through the tax code, right? That we, we don't do a great job of performance-based budgeting on the direct spending side, but we do a really bad job of spending on the tax side. So it's not for lack of effort in this town that we, you know, people have been pointing out for many, many, many years that we should be evaluating tax expenditures based on costs versus benefits and we just don't do it. And um, to squeeze in a shameless uh, uh, a point about deficit reduction, I, I often don't like it when we talk about proposals as being devoted to deficit reduction versus some other really attractive good thing because deficit reduction is this amorphous concept and I think we have to think more about opportunity cost, which is, I keep talking about the sequester, but you know, if it's for deficit reduction, it's instead of some other way of reducing the deficit. And I think that we have to keep bringing it back to what are those other ways of reducing the deficit that this would substitute for? Because otherwise, if it's just deficit reduction versus t cutting taxes here or spending more there, then that proposal is always going to lose and look bad. But if it's raising revenue to reduce the deficit, which means we don't have to reduce this de the deficit this other, worse way, then I think that the proposal has a lot more chance of being palatable to politicians. I don't know if there is any special framework uh, that you can use to evaluate these, except, of course, just looking at what is the objective or the possible set of objectives that this provision potentially could serve. So in the case of the mortgage reduction, you would say you know, maybe it's trying to promote home ownership. Uh, maybe in the case of the provisions Karen is looking at, maybe it's trying to promote national saving or to provide, promote financial security and so on. And then you simply ask, you know, in what areas would you expect this to function effectively and, and which not uh, based on economic theory, based on any statistical studies and so on. The one thing I would say is you draw the distinction between the ones that are provisions that are trying to promote social objectives and ones that are just pure pork adopted for political reasons. I think what we need to emphasize is that all the big money is in the first set of provisions. I mean, it's easiest, of course, to say let's get rid of the things that are pure pork in the tax code, just like it's easiest to say that on the spending side, let's get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse. But when we look at the spending side, we actually see that the dollars are in very popular, very widespread government benefit programs, such as Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. On the tax side, we see that the dollars are in things like the mortgage deduction, the retirement saving preferences, and, and so on. Uh, so our task is never going to be as easy as saying, this is a wasteful, ridiculous, irrational provision. Let's completely scrap it. That's a really easy call. Instead, it's always going to be something like, here's a provision that ostensibly is serving some kind of social objective, but let's actually think about whether it's really doing it effectively, whether it's appropriately targeted, and whether there is some way that we can restructure it, that although it may be painful, although it may require transition relief, you will bring us to a point where we have a smaller revenue loss but are still achieving our essential objectives. Adam, my memory may be wrong here, but I believe sometime last year there was a Hamilton Project paper, it isn't a full model, but that has an interesting discussion in it of some issues and criteria related to tax expenditure. Uh, well, I, I have to say I, I, I agree with Alan on this. I, I think a lot of the it's very difficult to, to draw black and white uh, distinctions between what's waste and what's not, uh, and which tax expenditures achieve uh, social benefits and which ones don't. Uh, we we uh, try to enumerate these, but but ultimately, I think it's a very subjective question. And it, you know, even within the mortgage interest deduction, uh, one can argue that some of it uh, obviously achieves a social uh, objective, uh, and then some of it's probably pork. And and um, so I. I think uh, it is very hard to tell. You go on this, yes. Mike Lawson, State and Local Government Leadership Center, George Mason University. My question is, and given my, my preface there, I've had, except for a couple instances, municipal bonds and earlier local codes, there have been no discussion of state and local governments, which are also part of the public sector. So. In light of that, I just open that general area up for just general comments about the impact on state and local governments and their taxpayers and their residents. Great question. Anybody want to jump in? Well, with my proposal, the states can still piggyback on the definition of, of, um, of the taxable income and itemized deductions. They could, they could choose whatever rate that they want to apply to itemized deductions still. So they might have to keep track of, 
um, itemized deductions separate from adjusted gross income and then apply their own rate limitations or not to the itemized deduction to cal calculate state taxable income. But I think that's doable. And I also feel like this is a better approach for deficit reduction for state and local governments because um, I think that if we raise, if we reduce the deficit on the federal side more through the revenue side, there's less likely to be an adverse impact on state and local governments. I mean, I think state and local governments probably, you know, would feel some impact because you would imagine that a reform effort that's comprehensive probably would make some modifications to either the municipal bond exclusion or the state and local tax deduction or both. I think Diane makes an important point, though, that you have to look at, you know, the comparison. Other ways of reducing the deficit would also impact state and local governments. They're not going to, I think, escape completely unscathed under any real deficit reduction plan. And so again, you just have to decide which provisions are effective and which are not. I mean, the municipal bond exclusion, I think, is pretty hard to defend as being a effective or efficient uh, or desirable way uh, to assist uh, state and local governments. Um, and so that, for example, as we go about setting priorities, I think is something we would want to try to either end or restructure. No, I, I think there's some interesting questions here, and part of it relates to whether some things that are beyond the four papers, certain kinds of other exclusions from income are closed. So if one looked at the 1986 Tax Reform Act, uh, it provided increased revenue to states because since states piggyback, in many cases, their definition of taxable income to the federal by broadening the base in the way the 86 acted, it broadened state income tax bases, and in fact, a number of states then went and cut rates to give back some or all of the increased revenue they got from broadening the base. Uh, in this case, on the other hand, there are issues on the state and local deduction, municipal bonds that, that could go in the other direction. Uh, so I think one would want to look at a mix. I was always fascinated by what happened at the end of the 2003 tax bill when a dividend cut was going to go through. And in its initial form, the cut in taxes on dividends in 2003 was a 50% exclusion, which would have cost states a bunch of money. And precisely because of the impact on states, at the very last moment, four governors, two Republican, two Democrat in the Senate, got it switched from a 50% exclusion to a 50% rate cut, in which case it no longer narrowed the state base. So uh, these were, are all important questions, I think, for policymakers to look at. And the underlying theme of your question, I think, is right, which is there is risk that decisions will be made without much attention to the impact on state and local finance. Uh, the person right behind you, I think, had a question. Thank you. This is. This is the question for Mr. Biot. Um, in reading your paper, I have a two-part uh, question, and the second part you can decide if you want to answer. The first part would be, from what I can see, what you're trying to do is sort of level the playing field, but on the same token, you're somewhat willing to have everyone penalize the Clintons, the McLeans, and God love her, the Sarah Palins of the world, who all own more than one home. And so my question is, are you assuming that those who own more than one home do not take their tax refunds and invest it back into the community? Are you, are you wor worrying that they send it overseas? And the other question, this is up to you if you want to answer, does your proposal, would, would your proposal affect you personally? Okay, well, uh. all right. <laughs> But, uh, well, I'm not a, a homeowner, so I guess uh, perhaps that uh, we, we all of us are always, uh, I guess it was Oliver Wendell Holmes who said that to try as we might, none of us can ever look at any policy issue through any eyes except our own. And uh, that's an inevitable limitation uh, that everyone uh, faces. No, the thing on the second homes is, uh, has nothing to do with any animus towards the people who own uh, two homes or more than two homes, uh, but simply asking what is the justification for a special government subsidy that treats that kind of expenditure more favorably uh, than normal run-of-the-mill expenditures. And I think the only real coherent goal of the mortgage uh, deduction is to try to promote home ownership. Uh, if somebody already owns one home, then uh, obviously that goal has been uh, satisfied. And I don't think that there's any uh, legitimate governmental objective uh, 
uh, served by subsidizing the second home uh, as well. Uh, so I think that is, uh, if in policy terms, a you know, relatively easy call. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go because there are more questions. Did you have a, you had your hand up? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I'm Jin Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I'm also with the Asian Real Estate Association of America, the DC chapter. Yeah. And I'd like to bring up the focus on home ownership because both, um, I think you and also Diane, Alan and Diane, and even Karen kind of propose um, not promoting home ownership with your, with your tax proposal. However, look at the whole big picture, the way that we are in the crisis today, partially is because of the crisis of the bubbles in the housing bubbles. And home building and construction has always been the core of our economy. So right now we still have a high number of un unemployment and almost like 40, 50% of those came from home uh, construction business. So I do feel that regardless of how much I'm, deduction. I'm, I'm sorry, the, we're almost out of time for the panel, so could you go to the question, please? Okay, so then my question actually have a little bit with Alan and Karen and, and Diane, because without, with you taking away the mortgage deductions, would you then not promoting home ownerships and, and people who can spend time buying a house, like even for the end, instead of putting their money into tax saving, if they put that in their house, they can stay in there and then they can get tax deduction and they can put that back into the market. Because with a home, they buy a lot of things. It's somehow subsidized. It's a stimulus kind of sort. When people have a house, they will okay. come well, out I'm, and they I'm, I'm spend sorry. many I'm, other I'm, things. I'm, I'm gonna, let, let's go to Al. I'm, okay, yeah, so let me say I'm, that. Uh, I'm not quite done yet, though. Because I'm sorry, you're not quite done, but the panel is out of time and we're looking for questions, not statements. I'm going to cut you off and I, go to Al. I do have a problem with the interest rate because you're saying that the 300,000. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, can yeah, someone like take I, the mic? I, I mean, I think you've stated. Uh, I apologize, but there's another panel after ours, and they need enough time too. Well, let me try to be brief. No, I think you've, you've stated your, your points. Um, first of all, let me say that long-run tax policy should never be set based on the idea of trying to maintain aggregate demand by promoting a particular product. Yes, of course, people who go out and build mansions are going to be contributing to aggregate demand. So would people who buy groceries, so would people who buy TV sets, so would people who buy furniture. Uh, there's no reason why aggregate demand says favor one sector over another. Yes, there is a timing issue. There is a transitional concern. But you know, this point about the bubble, to me, that would suggest that we actually want to move away from a, a situation where we have an artificially overexpanded uh, housing sector. Um, and then let me just say, I mean, your question repeatedly referred you know, to not promoting home ownership. But I mean, I would submit, and I think it would stand up under any reasonable analysis, that my proposal maintains and expands the incentive for home ownership, but not for the expensive uh, large houses. And you steer the benefit more to lower income households. So if you're worried about the uh, contractionary effect, Alan's actually made that bad, uh, a more stimulative proposal for the short term. OK, I, I think we are now uh, out of time for the panel and ready to go to the next. I want to thank Adam, Alan, Karen, Joe, and Diana.